Welcome to the third updated video on my new world building channel. We are plugging right along, and I've got a short original video for you, and then a bunch of new ideas and comments to sort through. So keep watching for the original and skip forward to this timestamp if you've already seen it. Hello, and welcome to part two of my video series where I break down how I created a system of clothing for a fantasy race. If you haven't seen the first video, you may want to watch it first, as it details how I came up with what I call the cultural baseline, which is the most common elemental clothing that anyone might wear, regardless of race, gender, class, or station. The next step is to extrapolate variations of this baseline, and then classify those variations by who I think might wear them. In this video, I'm going to classify what I think females in this culture would typically wear versus what males would wear. My chart is labeled male, female, but after giving it more thought, I realized it really should be masculine versus feminine, because these are guidelines, but not hard rules. In our culture, a girl can choose to wear a tux to prom, but she makes that decision knowing it's a masculine look and knowing it goes against conventionality. In the same way, a male or female in this culture could cross the standard lines, but to do so would say something about their character. For example, a woman who wears masculine work clothes? Maybe she's a single mother who's taken a typically male job requiring hard labor to feed her family. Or, if my feminine styles lean toward sacrificing practicality for what is seen as nicer, then a male who wore them might be thought of as impractical. The most extreme example I can think of for this is the king from the Three Musketeers movie a few years ago. Or, if women have started adopting male armor into daily clothing, maybe the world has gotten more dangerous as of late. Or if the men are wearing more ornamentation, maybe they're thriving economically and have more money to display wealth, and the society is spending more time creating art. So as you can see, establishing your rules only to break them can be very useful. There are lots of possibilities of how this line can be used to expand both the culture and the individual characters within the culture. So let's get into it. I'm starting with the simplest possible baseline to play with the variations. I originally did this sketching on paper, I just digitized it to make it a little cleaner for the video. But if you're trying something similar, I'd recommend using whatever's the quickest and most comfortable medium for you. Starting with the tops, if you watched the first video, you saw that I took a lot of inspiration from traditional Thai clothing. Before the tops, I was strictly looking at the women's wrapped tops. I want to maintain this very organic feel where the majority of the shapes are created through wrapping and draping basic rectangles of fabric, and using as little sewing as possible. So these shirts will not work. However, looking at only the tops worn by women, how to differentiate between masculine and feminine? The answer I came up with was the drapes. I decided that the extra hanging tail ends of fabric are pretty and add a lot of possibilities to your style, but they're impractical and would get in the way or get dirty if you weren't careful. So there it is. Women typically use longer pieces of fabric and have many options for how to wrap and drape their tops, whereas men typically keep the ends of the fabric neatly tucked in and nothing hanging loose, and don't try as hard to get creative with new drape variations. So for the women, an end could be thrown over one shoulder, or it could have two ends and drape over both shoulders. Or it could drape across the front and tuck into the back of the shirt. For men, I think the standard is this wrapped version. But the same thing could be done backwards, with the ends tucked in at the front and the cross at the back. Or it could be wrapped with the one shoulder style similar to the women's. This one actually looks really interesting to me, and I might make one shoulder tops part of the traditional category once I get to that point. Now most cultures in our history started out with everyone wearing some type of tunic, dress, or skirt, until pants were invented, usually exclusively for men. In this culture it's worked almost opposite, with the drapey pants being worn by everyone until contact and trade with the mainland led to skirts being introduced as an option exclusively for women. However, as a skirt would require a much larger piece of fabric, and thus a larger loom that not everyone would be able to have in their home, fabric for skirts usually has to be purchased, and therefore is a status symbol. When women do wear skirts, they're long and narrow. They can be simply wrapped or have fancy pleats and contrasting lining fabric. To hold up their pants or skirts, women use either fancy metal brooches or belts. Belts started out as an exclusively male style, but have become more commonplace for women because they're quite convenient for holding things such as pouches or weaponry. The level of decoration going into a belt or brooch is also a status symbol. One thing I decided way before making these videos was that long hair would always be braided, and that metal jewelry, chains, and bangles would be woven into the braids, at the ends and also at the roots, hanging across the forehead. This could be really simple, or get very elaborate, increasing with wealth and status. If the hair was washed out and rebraided once every couple of weeks, the jewelry could be swapped out then. Or it could be specially braided for an occasion with a fancy heirloom set. What is the one thing you picture a guy in our world wearing that's supposed to instantly let you know he's trying? A tie. 
I was trying to answer this with something that could be added to a male's clothing in this culture that instantly signified he was stepping up his game, and I came up with what I called a cross piece. It's a diamond-shaped metal plate suspended across the front of his top with either fabric or more metal. The plate could be worked decoratively or have some kind of crest or insignia if it was part of a uniform. And the last female element is a piece that covers the function of bras, bikini tops, and necklaces. The idea is that under the wrapped tops, women wear a tighter, thicker piece for support. The fabric is held up with decorative metal jewelry that can be very simple or get very elaborate, and is partially displayed with the tops, especially if they're strapless or one shoulder. The metal neck pieces can be easily removed from the fabric, making them more versatile to swap out. For swimwear, because this society spends a good portion of their lives underwater, the wrapped tops are removed and only the basic supportive piece worn. The last thing I want to cover is the armor, which I'm categorizing as male. Not because only men can wear armor, but because to wear armor is considered masculine and there's no feminine version of armor. If a woman needs to wear armor, they just wear the same armor as men. The armor is fairly simple, and I won't be going into weaponry in this video. Basic armor that a civilian might own consists of shoulder plates, bracers, and scale mail shirts. It can get more elaborate if it's ceremonial, or if it belongs to an actual soldier, but that's the gist. So there it is. Using these established rules, I can already start to come up with a number of variations, and context for who might wear them. The next category will be to introduce and sort out upper class and lower class variations, and work clothes from formal attire. But that will have to wait for the next video. Thanks for watching! There's not a ton that I hate about this video, but I think all of the ideas were really raw and broad, and they definitely need honed down for the different subcultures and the different time periods. But there are a few things that I've changed specifically regarding masculine and feminine styles. For their hair, I was originally thinking women would keep it long and braided, and men would keep it short. I changed that to allow for men's braided styling too, just because it felt more cohesive. For the women's necklace bra things, in experimenting and actually trying to make these garments, one thing that I discovered was that wrapping and pinning tops worked okay, but it worked much better if there was some kind of foundation to pin it onto. So I evolved this style into something like a short corset or a long line bra. Not something that would be worn tightly or restrict movement, but something that would be supportive add a little bit of posture and poise and be very important as a foundation for pinning wrapped tops onto. I think this further supports women having elaborately styled tops and men's being simpler. Another thing we discovered when making the clothes in real life was that individuals without much in the way of hips didn't have the right curves to keep the pants up well. So when needed, we added a single suspender beneath the top. I've also decided that some kind of undershorts are necessary. I decided that I don't like this, but there should be a lighter option than this. It might look something like this. Basically the pants, but short and sometimes gathered at the knee and a bit less voluminous. Something that primarily functions as underwear or boxers, but is acceptable to swim in as well. When it comes to swimming and changing between the water and the open air, what you wear would depend a lot on where you are. Those who live in the underwater city say they are middle or lower class and they live inside the city but work on a nearby underwater farm. They will be submerged most of the day and not exposed to direct sunlight. So a male might just wear a pair of shorts and a woman might wear shorts with a plain supportive top. They might also wear metal outer shoes to help weigh them down so that they can walk up right along the floor. Thank you to this comment for that idea. Say you live in the city, but you're upper class and aren't likely to get wet all day. I think you would wear a lot more jewelry and the wrapped tops would be more elaborate, and women would probably prefer light flowing skirts. I think the underwater city might see a drastic shift in fashion, as the needs would be very different from surface life. The wrapped tops would become primarily ornamental. Some young women might abandon wearing them regularly, instead expanding the corsets into outerwear. But when the Nauticans lived on the mainland, their clothing requirements were very different. They were frequently shifting from underwater in rivers and lakes to full and dangerous sun exposure. Say I have a Nautican who still follows the old ways and lives in hiding on the mainland. This is Zari, my original Nautican character. She has evolved a lot over the years, and when I went through my old art for the previous video, I remembered how much I loved every single version of her, and I decided to draw elements from all of them to create her look. Zari is a character who is roughly 20, and one of the few remaining Nauticans living along the rivers of the Jade Mountains. She has dense freckling, like many surface-dwelling Nauticans who've seen more sun exposure than is good for them. She wears her hair in simple braids she can style herself. For clothing, she can grow her own lotus silk to weave fabric. Thank you to this comment for lotus silk. She can gather plants for natural dyes of greens, browns, and golds, which handily helps her match her surroundings. And she can tan her own leather from the game she hunts. 
She also has some heirloom sea silk from back when trade was more accessible, but she probably wouldn't wear it often. Any Nautican jewelry or bronze she owned would be passed down from the previous generations of her family. I think Sari would make her short corset from dense leather. It wouldn't be as comfortable as silk, but it would provide a tiny extra measure of daily protection. She would wear practical undershorts, but she would wear long pants over them, neatly tied down and out of the way, but covering her legs to the ankle. Maybe she even has two pairs of pants, in contrasting colors for different terrains and different times of year. Her moccasins might be a bit more substantial with a thicker sole, as she would do more walking in rougher terrain. She wears a leather belt with an heirloom buckle, and depending on what she's doing, she can add pouches or a sheath for her nautican dagger to the belt. She wears sun protection on her lower arms for when her arms are exposed or her sleeves slide up, and fingerless gloves fixed with webbing to aid with swimming. Her lotus silk is dyed and painted. The patterns she paints on it are large and unrefined, but they help with her camouflage. Sometimes she wears more traditional wrapped tops, and the extra fabric in the wrapped tops is important. For physical activity, she might tuck in the drape and tie it down tightly, but when exposed to direct sunlight, she has that excess, which can be shifted and spread out and draped over her head and shoulders. Or for swimming, she might remove the top entirely and wrap it all around her waist, but she will always want to keep it with her. I think of it sort of like Scottish great kilts or Mexican rebozos, just like a big, versatile piece of fabric that becomes part of the outfit. However, when Nauticans were in contact with the mainlanders, other styles were exchanged. One style adopted by the Jade Mountain Nauticans was a lightweight, loose, hooded jacket. Zari's braids are capped in baubles that only appear decorative. Many of them actually unscrew and are hollow inside, a good waterproof hiding place for capsules, poisons, valuables such as gemstones, tiny tools and keys, and other useful objects. She is rarely seen by the other mainlanders, but when she is, she has a reputation for being something of a river witch. For this one, I wanted to start with a comment that was actually posted in the previous video. I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but I really appreciated the tone of the comment, though I don't agree with every part of it. I don't think the commenter has watched any of my other world building videos, which is fine. You don't have to watch a series before you're allowed to form an opinion. But I think they are missing a lot of context and nuance, so it's good to review things. The primary criticism I want to disagree with is the idea that Nauticans are white people with Asian clothes and African braids. They aren't meant to be white people as in Caucasian. Most most of my races are intentionally blends of multiple real-world races, and that's because I don't want any of them to be mistaken as allegories and have real-world history attached to them. I want to create their own history and struggles. When deciding the skin tones of various peoples, I looked at where they originally lived and what the climate was like. With Nauticans, I've always seen them as having very pale skin, almost too pale, like unearthly pale, because that makes sense. With them originally being intended as deep-sea mermaids and needing to soak up the maximum amount of vitamin D they can whenever they did break surface. I've always seen them as wearing tight braids to keep their hair protected from tangling in the water, and that might actually have originally come from Waterworld too. <laughs> Though at some point I decided they should have textured hair because Textured hair is cool, and it would work for them because textured hair would hold the braids for a good long time. Now, for their facial features, I don't think any real race matches what I picture. Mostly I picture somewhat, like, flat facial structures with particularly wide eyes almost protruding, and then nearly flat noses with slitted nostrils that can be opened and closed at will. But I am not anywhere close to good enough at drawing faces to illustrate that. <laughs> Basically, they are a grab bag of exotic aesthetics. I mean, no, but also kind of? That was part of the point of the original video. I was frustrated that the fantasy genre so often defaults to European and medieval, and few world builders seem to give clothing the creative consideration that I feel like it deserves. Part of the exercise was intentionally using other sources of inspiration, and to show people that it's okay to try something different, and not just default to floor-length princess dresses and chainmail and tunics. Now, did I do it well? Eh, I mean... Eh. This bit here, ending with a very confused group of aliens that are trying to appear human. It's a very good point, but it's actually perfect. I haven't gotten to any of the history of the world yet, but in short, my world is not evolved or natural. It was originally colonized by future humans trying to recreate a home world they had never seen. Then magic happened, and an apocalypse, and everything lost touch over a millennia or two. So basically, a very confused group of aliens that are trying to appear human is actually a great description. And then finally, perhaps if the designs were further derivative from the source material. And yes, I heartily agree with that. I do not see any of these designs as final. When I first started making world building videos, that was the idea. I thought world building videos had to be like, 
here's how you do a thing. But with world building content, I've realized that what I actually enjoy is using the videos to explore and test ideas, allowing me to refine them. The comment section is very important to me as I don't know everything, and it helps me to sort out what works from what doesn't. With the Nauticans specifically, maybe the original designs work as a sort of foundation to build on, but I've put a lot more thought into them since, working on a timeline of their history and then different offshoots and civilizations they might have formed in different locations at different time periods, all of which would have evolved some kind of unique variation of fashion based on the settings and resources. And that is partly why I wanted to sketch out Zari for this updated video, to show one potential derivation from the original designs. Derivia derivation? <laughs> so again, thank you for this comment. I like conversations, and the internet is just too often an avalanche of angry accusations. I'm sure my answers won't make everybody happy, but if anybody watching disagrees with me on a particular point, please feel free to leave your own comment and join the discussion. Okay, for this comment, I haven't completely thought out the armor yet. It shouldn't be purely ceremonial, but it wouldn't work if it was too heavy. I don't think much fighting would be done underwater, as they mostly quarrel with the mainlanders and avians, and any underwater fight against an opponent without gills would be very short. However, they do occasionally come into small conflicts with the deep sea mermaids. So if they were fighting underwater, the center of gravity would shift, which is why I stacked the armor more on the head and chest and shoulders, as those places would be the most vulnerable if you were swimming towards something. I think most of their fighting would be done above water, which I haven't really thought much about at all. <laughs> Other than that, fighting near water would still put them at the best advantage, because drowning their opponents would always be the simplest way to win. For weapons, I think spears and maybe something like nets or tridents would be used. Short swords and daggers would be good too. I don't think they would use anything like bows or arrows though. I think close combat would be their bent, though I don't really have anything to justify it yet. Okay, this comment was fun and went long, and I already answered most of it in the comment section and then in the previous comment, but yes, I'm still married to the idea of scale mail. They fish. <laughs> Okay, this one. Good point. They should definitely be smaller. I might even rethink them entirely or make them extremely ceremonious, like upper class only in the underwater city. I don't really know yet. I'm not so in love with the idea anymore, but I'm also not quite ready to toss it yet. Why is impracticality and beauty related to femininity in your culture? My initial reasoning was flimsy. Women being far more willing to make impractical sacrifices for beauty is just something common across many cultures, but I don't really think I need a reason. Sometimes I think it's fun to world build just by making things how you like them and how it feels right, and then trying to extrapolate out some kind of logic later. Maybe it's religion, maybe it's based on social hierarchies, but maybe my Nautican ladies are just flashy and slightly vain. <laughs> now there's a weird thing I've noticed. In almost every single world building video, there's at least one comment asking me to evolutionarily justify why my people wear clothes, and often specifically justify why women cover their boobs. But look, I don't want to criticize anybody. World building and storytelling are incredibly personal. You make what you want to make. I think that we make the heroes we wish we could be and the villains we wish we could fight. So if you want your heroes to be sexy gods and goddesses fighting in chainmail bikini armor and that makes you happy, okay. <laughs> if you find it more satisfying to follow your own sense of strict evolutionary logic, Fine. I love clothes and design. The idea of creating a fantasy people who don't wear any clothes at all just sounds like really boring to me. And for women covering up their boobs, well, the world was colonized by future humans, so maybe a sense of modesty was something they passed on. I don't really care, and I don't really find it necessary to justify. And one more comment from the last video. I would love to read a story set just in the smaller world of your original River Mermaids. I do too now. Like, going through all that old art really made me love River Mermaids again, and the idea for Nauticans evolved from the idea for River Mermaids and was kind of meant as a replacement. But now I'm thinking of the history and the timeline, and I'm like, there's room for both. <laughs> but it would also be actually really interesting, because that would mean that at some point in history the Nauticans moved in and displaced the River Mermaids, and then now in current year they are the ones being displaced. It does add depth. And then what happened to the River Mermaids? Like, did they find somewhere else to live? Or did they just go extinct? I don't know yet. I have mostly focused my world building and storytelling all on one central continent, but there are other vaguely defined continents where I shuffle ideas that I like, but which don't exactly fit with the main story, like zebra centaurs. So maybe the River Mermaids found a new home there. All right, this is where I'll leave you for this video. The new channel is actually doing pretty well. This is only the third video and we're already past 2,000 subs, and I'm about a quarter of the way with watched hours towards getting monetized, so thanks for that. And if you want to help the channel grow faster, you can like this video and add anything you want in the comments. <sighs> okay, little birds.
Did we have a nice nap? Oh, you're so cute. Come see me. Hello, pretty bird. Hello there. Good little chicken. Um, this is a cinnamon queen. I used to have a cinnamon queen. She was my favorite chicken ever. And um, the people that I had to get my chickens to, they, they said that she's the best chicken they've ever had. They said that you would like go and open the coop and she would just like run at you and leap into your arms. So I got another cinnamon queen, we will see. They do seem to be smart. She and the other one as well, like they were the first ones to really like figure out how to jump up and then perch on things. So that's cute. Hello there. Good little girl. Good little girl. Um, let's see. Come here. Hi, hi. This is a silver laced Wyandotte. I mean, they're just really pretty birds. Like you should look them up. They have like these whitish feathers with like black rims around them. Very pretty. Hi there, pretty girl. This is um, an Americana. Um, they lay blue eggs, bluish. People tend to exaggerate with chicken colors. So I'm very excited. She is my favorite so far. She has a very good personality and she's very chill. Good girl. And then I got two, oh, don't jump on each other. And then I got two of these. These are called um, Sapphire Gems because supposedly they have like bluish purplish tones in their gray like wings, which like, okay, again, people exaggerate with chicken colors. I can kind of see it, a little bit of the blue undertones, but like, come on, she's gray. And then, oh, oh, a um, Midnight Majesty Moran. The Morans tend to lay like really dark brown eggs. So that's exciting. I'd like to get some olive acres, but I can't get any locally. I'd have to buy, um, hatching eggs online and try that out. So maybe next year I'll get some olive eggers. Hi, pretty girl. You are not as trusting as some of your siblings, but you are a giant fluff ball. Okay. Brief unplanned chicken um, update. I was gonna just like have them all on my shoulders, but like, <laughs> that was the most distracting thing in the world. They were all like shifting around and like chirping in my ears. <laughs> <laughs> that would have made such a distracting video. I couldn't do it. Yes. Yeah, set my shoulder. Be my good little shoulder chicken. Good girl. Yes. You're okay. Okay, we'll get you a friend. Come on. Good girls. Good girls. Yes. Okay, you two, sit. Oh, this is probably not gonna go well. <laughs> okay. Hey, welcome to the third updated video. Oh, oh, babies. Welcome to the third updated video on my new world building channel. We are plugging right along. I've also got, I've got a sh <laughs> Oh, this is kind of a bad idea. Yes, chirpy chirpy, chirpy chirpy. You're not having a good time balancing, are you? You want to sit on my arm instead? Yes. Chirp, chirp. Chirp, chirp. Chirp, chirp, chirp. Careful. Whoop. Okay. Well, come on, on my hand. Okay, I will take you. Nope. Big old plop to poop. Yep. You're very distracting. You're very cute, but very distracting. Go take a nap. Come on. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Look at your pretty, pretty wings. They're gonna be beautiful. Here, go take a nap. You're okay. I know you don't like to go in the dark, but you do like it once you're there. I feel like I need to start over.